Um, I am hugely honored, pleasured, excited. Um, my name is Ininye Udaporo and I'm the founder and director of Enrich Learning. Just a very brief bit about Enrich Learning before I begin, because some of you will have never heard of it before. So I started it when I was 12, I'm 22 next week. Woo! Um, so I've been doing it for 10 years um, and it's an online education platform and tuition center. Um, and yeah, it's like my little child that's now growing. Um, as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement, I felt that in some way, shape, form, I wanted to contribute. Um, and so I felt the best way to do it was with what I know, which is with education. However, I thought it would be even better to get, um, I think, like the nation's experts on this. Um, and so with me today, I have, and forgive me, Michael's name is Nigerian, so I can pronounce that. German, I didn't do so well at school. So Dr. Miranda Kaufman, yes? Kaufman. Kaufman. Um, so Dr. Miranda Kaufman is the author of the Wolfson History Prize and, oh my goodness, I cannot pronounce this, but Naif Al-Rodhan, was I close? Um, prize shortlisted book, Black Authors, The Untold Story. Those of you who have signed up to the course, I'm gonna be sending you a free copy um, for of this book um, and I hope that you find it really informative as well as this session. Um, Miranda read history at Christ Church Oxford and is now an honorary fellow at the University of Liverpool, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and a senior research fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, School of Advanced Study, University of London, where she co-convenes the successful What's Happening in Black British History workshop series with Michael Ohajuru. In 2018, she initiated the Teaching Black Tudors project, working with secondary school teachers to create resources to bring this history into the classroom. She is currently working on her second book, Heiress, The Caribbean Marriage Trade, and as lead historian for the Colonial Countryside Project, a collaboration between the National Trust and the University of Leicester, led by um, Corrine Fowler. Did I get that right? Thank you. And we have Michael Ohajuru. And I always get super excited when I meet people with Ibo heritage. So like, I'm just super excited. Um, Ibo is a tribe in Nigeria, for those of you who don't know, but we can get into that another time. Michael Ohajuru is a senior research fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, where he has co-convened the What's Happening in Black British History workshop series alongside Miranda since 2014. He was a successful senior executive in the mobile communications industry before retiring in February 2013 to carry out voluntary work in the arts and for the black community. Born in Liverpool, England, he holds honours degrees in physics, from Leeds University and art history from the Open University. He specializes in the Black African presence in Renaissance Europe with a particular interest in the Black Magnus and John Blank, the, his, the Tudor trumpeter, the inspiration for his John Blank project, which has inspired artists to imagine the Black Tudor trumpeter in a series of new Black and white A4 portraits, which he hopes to exhibit. So, Guys, we have the very best of the best in front of us. I'm super excited to get started. Please feel free to ask questions. What will happen is there will be a formal Q&A um, session, but you will be able to ask questions as we're going along and I will collate them. If you're watching this on YouTube, even though you're not part of the group, I will still take questions. But of course, the actual students, I call you students for this next hour, um, will get first dibs on the questions. So yeah, I'll try and get round to everyone. Um, and we're going to start with, when does Black British history start? So Michael, Miranda, over to you. <laughs> That's a great question to start. When did Black British history start? Well, let me, let me tell you around. when did history start? You know, because Black British history is is, is part of history. And that, and that thing is something really, I like to put up front, that there's a, a world history, and black history relates to that, but relates to British history, so, as, as that interrelates to world history. So it's, it's it's a tributary of world history. It's understanding that. I think that I think the agreement that that's important that we make it. We don't isolate it on its own. It's not just black British history. It's integrated. It's part of world history. Part of British history. 
Yeah. Um, so I think uh, perhaps the answer to this question will change the more research is done. But I suppose that um, we, we might start with the Romans. Um, but of course, even when we think about the Romans, that's an international history all of its own. And it's because the Roman Empire spread so widely that it, it um, came a, a reason that, that people travelled to the British Isles from Africa. Um, and Michael, do you want to say any more about that? I mean, we know that Emperor Septimus Severus... No, well, okay, well, okay th th let me just step back a bit. Because <laughs> a lot of people talk about black history and black British history as two distinct things. And I, I go back to where I started, I started. I started discussing in terms of world history. Black British history is a tributary, and you have to see it in context. I think that's really important. So we start with the Romans. And particularly you have to bear in mind, Britain's an island. Everybody has come here. So on the, to understand history, you have to literally understand the history of migration, the people who have come to this island. And I'm going to say the quote up from the famous quote from uh, Peter Fryer, and you're smiling around. You know what I'm going to say, the opening line of Peter Fryer's text. You know, there were, <laughs> there were black Africans in Britain before the English. Now, if you can understand what that means in terms of, of the point Miranda made about the Romans and Septimus Ceremus, he was here, there was an Ethiopian legion on the on the um Hadrian's Wall. On the Hadrian's Wall. And 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 the fact that that the fact that the Anglo-Saxons didn't come till later, didn't appear later in England. They came from they came from, from Europe. Or, 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 well, what was essential well, it wasn't Europe then, but but the mainland, they, they came to Ireland. So it's understanding that that that. That history, how Britain, black people have been here since the ages. I, I, you know, we, we look at, uh, if we, okay, if we, if we start at the Romans, then we've got to talk about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the beachy head lady, the ivory bangle lady. These are all remains of people that found that, were, that came to Britain, or were born, some were being born in Britain, that came with the Romans. So if you start there and then move forward, so and, and see black British history as a, as a continuum from then on, from moving forward. And the one I, I, I should have had, sorry, I'm, I'm, a point I should have made, and apologies for bringing it in too late, is Cheddar Gorfman. You know, I'd forgotten about him. That was that's ten thousand. That predates the Romans. And that frustrates a lot of people. He was he was brown. He was dark skinned very dark skinned with blue eyes. This was ten thousand years ago. Cheddar Gorfman. So the idea of dark skinned black people been here for millennium millennium so for me british history as they start with the race really starts with the romans and then we move into a, what for want of a better word we call it the dark ages it's not really the dark ages it's not it's not as well documented in many ways but things were happening i, I like to talk about um there's a in the doomsday abbreviato there's a black figure there this is 1250 there's a black presence in that in that uh, in that document because so you wonder how did they know about black people in twelve in twelve fifty Britain, and how did they get into a Doomsday Bravado? That, well, that, that's a challenging question in its own right, but at least begs the question: but how did they get here? Because he must have come from somewhere else. And, and if I move forward a little bit to um, Robin Hood, do you remember the Robin Hood? And you had the Black Friar Tuck. There, there was outrage that the BBC should desecrate history like this, and you have to say, calm down. That idea that we were black people during the during the 12th, 13th century, highly likely. You saw um, um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, when you had the, the black character in there. Where did he come from? The same place that Friar Tuck might have come from. Might have come from. We don't know for certain. But in terms of uh, the, the Saracens that they met on the Crusades, because Britain was active in the Crusades. And what's really great about all of that period that Michael was just talking about is that it's not just sort of a, a TV fantasy or anything. We have skeletons, you know, that is how we know about some of those, those black presences. Uh, you know, there are skeletal remains of uh, these individuals that have been analyzed. They've sort of the ivory bangle lady uh, is buried near York and they call her that because they found an ivory bangle in her grave. Um, and that's how they've identified her. And equally in the medieval period, um, as Michael knows, uh, you know, they found, I think, several African skeletons in a burial yard in Ipswich. Yeah, East Anglia, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And they came from North Africa. And there's some really exciting things that they, they do today with isotopes. Now, I don't fully understand it, but the magic is they can take a tooth 
and see what they, where they were born, the air that they breathed, the water that they drank, the food that they ate. They can analyze that and say, well, where that came from. Mm. And, they can, and these people were proven to come from, from Africa, but here they are in Britain. And yeah, not- I found that as well with the skeletons of the Mary Rose that there was a documentary on uh, last year or the year before. Uh, and, and again, they'd, they'd taken the skeletons of the shipwreck of the Mary Rose that sunk. Uh, in the middle of the, in the reign of Henry VIII, and they'd found not only two of the individuals had African origin, but one of them had clearly grown up in, I think, in Cornwall, but like in in England mm. because of what they'd been eating and drinking, and they could figure that out from their teeth. So you know, there's some really sort of solid scientific evidence for this. It's not just a, you know, we're drawing in the um, edge of it. The Doomsday Abbreviato for those of us who who don't, who don't study. <laughs> The twelfth century is um, you might have heard of the Doomsday Book, um, which was you know when uh, William the Conqueror got someone to write down every bit of land he'd inherited, he'd got, he'd just conquered. Uh, but by the, by the twelve forties, they needed to abbreviate it because it's too long. So they wrote an abbreviated version, and that's where we find this this image. Um, yeah. So, but we're kind of straying into question two, aren't we? Well, before we stray into question two, I think I want to kind of draw out something. Um, and I guess Miranda will be able to answer this more. So perhaps you as well, Michael. But thinking back to what I learned at school and the history period, especially in primary school, what they love to teach is the Tudor period. Right. So what's that like? 1485 to 1603 and if I've gotten that wrong well I've just embarrassed myself in front of everyone but what what I remember was Henry VIII and his however many wives beheaded divorced whatever there was a song about it and never anything about black Tudors I did not know that we had black Tudors until two weeks ago when I was doing some research about this. So before we move on to the next question, I guess, seeing as you're here and those that are in the class will be reading your book, um, you know, what what do you think you could add in terms of when did Black British history start? So when were they really prominent Black figures in that time, in the Tudor period? Well, Michael, Michael's smiling because we have this bugbear about prominence because um, you know, I think that uh, for too long, part of the problem with history has been this obsession with kings, rulers, you know, great men, and uh, you know, we, what part of what we what, what we learn when we study Black British history is that you know these were just ordinary people. They didn't have to be special. I mean, part of the story is that just they were there, they were there, and part of the sort of warp and weft of, of British history. Um, and you know, if we only ever Look at somebody be prominent. We're we're pretty much uh, you know stuck with the same old things that you you find quite dull when you learn them at school. Well, <laughs> um, I mean, I have to say that Henry VIII and his six wives divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. That's uh, the song. Were, were part of what drew me into Tudor history in the first place because it is quite a drama. The the Tudor family kind of saga is pretty pretty. Um, meaty stuff but probably the way they teach at school kind of cuts all the sex out so it's not <laughs> but, um, uh, so I think but I think um you know going back to what we we're trying to say perhaps is that um that the individual that sort of Michael has spent a lot of time imagining and thinking about is John Blank um who I think has more of a prominence really uh, within Black British history because we have a portrait of him and that you know a, a pictures, picture, pictures speak, images speak louder than words, and um, it's uh, you know it, it's just the first image that we have of of an African in, in Britain that we know of that was a definite person that we can tie into the archival record as well. Uh, so he was a trumpeter to King Henry the Seventh and King Henry the Eighth. Um, so you so I, I it, you know and that's that's been handy when trying to bring black Tudors into the classroom because everyone studies those kings so it's not that hard to kind of add that there was actually a black presence at the court. Yeah and I think what I found really interesting from what you've just said is um, the, the importance of art in all of this. I think now when we're in the middle of a global pandemic and I I, I I personally believe the arts has been a little bit neglected. History has been neglected. No one's really talking about what's going to happen to museums and and galleries. Um, It's really important that we have that kind of art because 
you know what what you see is so much easier to connect with it you know so being able to see um john blank in in an image can help not just young people but people like myself feel like okay so we have been here since forever we've not just come you know because of windrush which moves me on to the next section which is about the kind of the black british migration you know when i was at school we were not taught when black people came here and um michael's kind of made us aware that you know we're talking about 10 hundreds been here for over a thousand years no i did not swim to the uk thank you very much that was often a running joke when i was in primary school um, and even when i got to secondary school sometimes some um misinformed children and sometimes adults would make this joke but when did we migrate here um if there is actually a date to pinpoint i probably asked the wrong question i'm probably going to get told off now but you know how did black people get here and when did it happen is there any record of it sorry did you say that people asked you if you'd swum here oh it's this thing yeah like oh did you swim from africa it's this joke that i i don't even understand it myself but yeah <laughs> Well, I mean, I would, if, you know, it, not the flipper, it's quite a, amusing in a way, in a, it, what's actually interesting about that is that in my, in the period that we, we particularly study in the 16th and 17th century, Africans were famous for their ability to swim and dive. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, most British people, most European people didn't know how to swim at all you know even sailors didn't learn how to swim because they thought it was better to die quickly because the ship wasn't going to turn around and get them if they fell overboard so you know it, it and at, but whereas you know in, in uh, one of the other black tutors we know about is Jacques Francis who was who, a salvage diver who brought goods up from the wreck of the Mary Rose so you know it's actually I think I think that yeah anyway on you need to answer your question when 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 did black first come to britain as i've tried yeah to i mean i know you're going to tell me off for that because no, i am we've all there's we've always been <laughs> varying degrees you can question the numbers but black people have always been here from miranda's three what was it 300 in the tudor times that she found in the record to the ten thousand or so in the um in, in the georgian times and today when sort of 40 percent of london is is, is, is black so we've always been here the challenge is what did we wh where did we come from and what did we do what did black people do and that's part of the wonder of, of what we're doing now we're, we're kind of backfilling history some people argue we're rewriting history you know we're rewriting because you know we're finding out that the that black people actually voted in the 17th century hang on a sec oh, black people in the 17th century voting what's that about they were there black people were there they have their own property you know they they, they live lives as miranda indicated they were just ordinary people and that's that, 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 that that's where um, i get a bit excited <laughs> or animated in the sense that too many people cannot imagine a black tudor cannot imagine a georgian tudor they have to think well the windrush had started then i have to say calm down calm down we've always been there wherever britain has been they brought it back i love the quote you know the david lammy quote it's, okay it's an old quote but i love it it says i am here because you were there Black people have been here because Britain has been to the four corners of the world. Yeah. So if you accept that, then the challenge is to find out, well, Britain was in Suriname. Okay, are there any Surinese people here? Are there any Surinese objects? You can look at the Surinese history of Britain. It, it, it's there. And it's, it's accepting that. And for me, this is, this is the root of my um, John Blank project. I talk about, can you ima imagine the Black Tudor? Because too many people have a failure of the imagination in terms of the black presence in Britain and how it got here. It's it's a political question. It's an economic question. It's a social question. It's a geographic question. It's it's a, it's it has many facets to it. So when did Britain come in? We were we've been here for, for I was going to be dramatically forever. I mean, I think I think that people underestimate how much people have always moved around this globe. You know, uh, you just find you it. it, it People sort of think globalization is a modern phenomenon, but it goes way back. But I mean, I think I think that uh, part of our part of the thing with history is a, is about evidence as well, and where how much evidence have you got? And so the record, the nature of the records changes over the centuries, in especially in terms of the black presence. So we were saying earlier, you you have skeletons, but by the time you get into the 16th century, 
you start getting parish registers where um, baptisms, uh, marriages and burials are all recorded in local churches. And that's where we start to get a lot more information about the numbers of individuals. And that's why we have records of hundreds of Africans in the 16th and 17th century and move by the time you're in the sort of mid 18th century, uh, mid to late 18th century, um, you know, people are making kind of sweeping generalizations about there being 20, you know, in uh, where were we, 17, 68 there's as somebody says in a british court of law that there are 20,000 now and there'll be another 20,000 next week kind of thing so so you know the numbers are really are really there and um uh, but i think just to be a bit more prosaic than michael's imaginative um point is that um they they begin the in terms of the tudor period at least um one of the things we have to remember is that europe was black yeah there were plenty it wasn't just Britain there were plenty of black people across Europe in this period mm -hmm. and that's particularly in southern Europe and so uh, even before England English people started traveling around the Atlantic and around the globe they had quite a lot of um, interaction with the Spaniards the Portuguese the Italians and they in turn were having increasing interaction with Africa and so someone like John Black might well probably came via the Spanish court and you know there was sort of almost sort of ten percent of some Spanish and Portuguese ports at this period were black, were black people. Mm -hmm. so, so you have that movement via Europe as well. And then from the 1550s, um, the Tudors start actually sailing to Africa on their own account and trading with Africans, uh, not trading in enslaved people, but uh, buying gold, ivory. Melagueta pepper, which is a certain sort of spice known as grains of paradise. So there, there's a trade going on, and that's another way that Africans then start to come to uh, uh, particularly London um, directly. Uh, mm. And from here, they learn English, and then they go back to their home uh, towns and act as merchants and traders there, because then they can help with the language issue. Uh, and, and, and actually, on that point, I, I just want to... Um, you know, make it very clear that black people were not just slaves, because this is another rhetoric that I've heard throughout my childhood. You know, here we, we are being told by historians that, you know, we tra black people traded and um, we were musicians and um, they owned land. They voted. They had homes here. Um, you know, it, I think it's really, really healthy for all people to be aware of the fact that, yes, we know that some black people were slaves and that was an awful period and an awful time. But there were equally black people who were liberated, who were freemen um, and seemed like they were also very well educated. And I find that extremely interesting. Yeah, and even at the peak of, of uh, British involvement in enslaving people in the traffic and um, in getting huge fortunes from their colonies, there were still um, black British people in Britain who, you know, in the think of Ignatius Sancho, he was mm. writing letters to the great and the good. He had his portrait painted by Gainsborough. And as Michael said, you know, he voted, he could vote in elections. He had an obituary written when he died, you know, uh, and he's just one of various figures, you know, um, Dido Elizabeth Bell grew up at Kenwood. You might have seen the film Bell, which uh, twists the history slightly. But um, yeah, the basic point is there that she 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 have, was living the life of a quasi aristocrat. Um, and you know, these these people are kind of still what we might call the celebrities and the prominent people. And there were many other ordinary people who whose lives were less glamorous. But they there was this possibility of of freedom and a life sort of beyond slavery, even during the peak of, of that period of enslavement. And, you know, in the earlier period, uh, you know, different things were happening again. And, you know, there were princes, you know, there's one, there's a couple, there's a prince in my book who comes to London in, uh, he's baptized on New Year's Day, 1611 in St. Mildred's Poultry, which is sadly no, no longer exists, but it's just around the corner from the Bank of England, right in the heart of the city of London. So so there's just completely like different stories that, you know, and, and it's just such a travesty that, the only bit of only time that you know people ever think about um, the history of African people in Britain, they think about enslavement because that's just not the whole story. Yeah, it, it's 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 such an easy narrative. It's such an easy narrative to say that black people in slavery and kind of re re reduce black British history to slavery, colonialization, co colonization, and immigration. And it's much much more nuanced than that. There was much other things happening. You know, m m as I say. M m 
Miranda's talked about some, some, some of the things that happened in slavery, but if we, if we move forward a little bit into colonialization in terms of the oppression that was happening in, in Kenya and India, but there were things happening in Britain here. There was some very successful um, Kenyans, Indians, and they were making their way in society. And that's one of the, the dilemmas of British society in terms of, we look at a man like Ignatius Sancho, they were obviously voting. At the same time, some of the people he was working with were slave owners. They were dealing in slavery. So there's this dichotomy in British society in terms of black people were part of it at the same time that they were being oppressed elsewhere. Yeah. So there's a kind of, I, I think there's a kind of, uh, not by a hidden history, but a denied history in terms of the, the empire and colonies happened over there. But when you come to Britain, well, you're a free man, you know. What, what, what's the quote? No, the, 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 the air is so green, the, the air is so free, yeah. you cannot be a slave in, in Britain. So we have a, there's a kind of a freedom here in Britain. And we can talk a bit about that freedom in late, in later on, but there's a freedom which is very different from what black people are, are, are enduring in the colonies, in, in the, the Caribbean and elsewhere. So it's understanding that that, 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 that sense of uh, freedom and presence is, is what we have in Britain is very special. An Englishman, that's why you know, I'm really impressed by Ignacio Sancho. He was an Englishman, a man of letters. You know, a bunch of circus and dining with, with, with some great people, having, having his painters, his, photo, his photograph taken, <laughs> painted by <laughs> painted by the great people of the day. And there are there are other paintings of 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 of, of, of Africans being painted by um, uh, great painters of the great uh, artists of the day. So I think there's a there's a, a, a dichotomy at the heart of Britain, and I would argue maybe we'll talk about that again later on. It's to do with class. As you move up the class. As you become a little more wealthy, as you enter into the, the operations of society, you become one of them. <laughs> in the sense, mm -hmm. you become part of society, and that's the battle that we're seeing. Maybe when we come and talk about freedom, we 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 can address this issue. Yeah, and that really takes us on to the last question. Before I take questions from everyone who has questions to ask, um, is what do you consider to be pivotal moments in history for Black people in the UK? And I guess. For me, um, I consider a real pivotal moment now, we, right now, so not, well, this is history in a sense, because I do feel like the present time is also history, but um, as a young person who was born here um, and has grown up with some really horrendous racism, um, to see how the Black Lives Matter movement has uprooted and just shone and been able to make people listen and the fact that this is happening right now that's a real pivotal moment because i think if i did this six months ago or even a year ago people wouldn't be interested people wouldn't really want to know people wouldn't understand that you know black people have been here since forever and um we're more than just slaves we were more than just um, you know, we were free and we had land and we traded. I mean, that's so incredible and it's so empowering for me. And I would love to kind of know what what you guys think are our pivotal moments. And, and, and yes, Michael, adding to that kind of what freedom really is and was for black people. I think you're on the money in terms of Black Lives Matter. I think it's a very different kind of thing that's happening now, Black Lives Matter. If we look at the riots in the 80s and the 70s, then things happened. But then nothing happened. Nothing really changed. Nothing really changed. And we still, even today, we've got um, in, in, in injustice in, 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 the, uh, in the criminal justice system in terms of the disproportionate number of black people, particularly black boys, who are being locked up. The, you know, the, look at the uh, education, health. Look at health now with this, the, the, the COVID and the disproportionate number of black people. So the kind of freedoms we have, it's still an ongoing battle. And so Black Lives Matter, I think, is important and it's different because we're seeing not just black people, but white people on the streets yeah. you know, saying there's something wrong here. But if we go back, other pivotal points. So we know when you gave me this question, I was trying to think, you know, well, slavery, that's a big point. But I would say it was more, more subtle, that there was more, more little nuanced points in terms of, you know, I, I, the one that I, I know we've mentioned it a couple of times, but getting the vote. Been as an, a, a black man getting the vote, or to your you, one of your character, one of your um, uh, characters, Miranda, the swarthy, the he was able a, a black man testifying in court. You know the fact that we had a the, the, that the word of a black man could, could, could be um, accepted as um, 
as proof in the criminal court. And this, when you look at what's happening in America in terms of uh, the chattel slavery, in terms of how black people treated, so Britain was very different in the way it treated black people. Now we could we could argue they didn't do it well, but nevertheless, I think the entering into society, owning a piece of property, having some property and being part of society, that was Britain allowed black people to do. And so I think when you look at the the, the uh, being allowed to testify in court, having a vote, being able to have property, those are seminal points that give us a base in society. After that, you know, uh, I guess it's you have to look to um, there's some you know, the um, cases of you know, the, the first the, this, we, we we're reduced to celebrities then. Well, the first time we became a mayor, the first time we held a, we became an officer in 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 the British Army, the first time we 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 um, we were um, a pilot or a fighter, a fighter pilot during the war. Those are all important points. But I would argue it's the underlying movement in society that allows people to grow and be educated to, to, to in, into those positions. So the pivotal form to me, as I say, it's, it's difficult to say, but I think Black Lives Matter would be one today, yeah? And if you look at the riots, and the, no, I'd have to go back to the to voting, being part of society, having a foot in society. What do you think, Miranda? Uh, well, I get I was quite stumped with this this question to start with because I suppose I, I I sometimes get too engrossed in the detail and then it's harder to think about the bigger picture. But I'm going to give an answer that you might not expect, which is um, I think uh, the Reformation. I think Henry VIII wow. Rome. Uh, which seems like something straight out of your your old t history Tudor history lesson, but that I think is the moment when English history took a a sharp turn. You know, it's we 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 it cut off our connections with our historic connections with Europe. We became kind of expelled from Christendom. You know, the Pope excommunicated us, and that was the moment that um, the English had to look beyond Europe. For the first time, and think, well, what do we do now? And and you and I think it, I think it really, did, you know, um, the right, the, the the rivalry with Spain, particularly that then emerges, that you know, the fear of the Catholic Spanish Empire kind of take invading and taking over, um, you know, drives this sort of Protestant urge to go out and sort of explore, discover the world, beat the Spaniards at their own game, and which eventually leads to you know, international trade, colonial um, colonialism and everything that comes out of that. So that's my, my big answer that I came up with. <laughs> Miranda, I, 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 more, many more Africans coming to, to England. Uh, and in one way we didn't talk about earlier, which is privateering. So capturing Spanish and Portuguese ships uh, at big, and taking everything they found on the ship back back to Britain, including enslaved Africans, because the Spanish and the Portuguese. Some, we quite often forget we've become so obsessed with the British slave trade and how we, you know, how we brilliantly ended it. Not, uh, but you know, the, <laughs> we become so obsessed with the British um, involvement in in slave trafficking that um, we forget that actually it was initiated by the Portuguese um, sort of a hundred years earlier. So in the early the early years of the 16th century, the early 1500s, is when the first um, enslaved Africans are brought across the Atlantic, and the sort of 300,000 um, transported across the Atlantic before 1619, which is when the first Africans arrive in Virginia, an English colony. So, so, so it's 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 not just a British phenomenon; it's a European history as well as an Atlantic history. Miranda, I'd, I'd, I'd go, I'd go some way with you with, with with the Reformation in terms of Britain had to look elsewhere. I'd challenge you though. Let me let me put on the spot in terms of how su how successful it was in terms of Britain tried to you know that the Morocco ambassador came here. They tried to deal with the Ottoman Empire, and it never really happened. It never really succeeded. It was it was doing deals with the with with their old with those who were against the Pope, which is essentially the Protestants in in Germany, that they succeeded. So in terms of Britain really uh, moving out into the world, I thought it was that was a kind of a baby step. It wasn't as big as, as, as well, later on. There's a pivot that then changes the direction and it's still like an uphill climb to get to you know your first colony. Hmm. 
um, but but you know, 1607, finding founding Jamestown, Virginia. But but I think that that's I think that's where you can trace the. Oh dear, sorry, that was a message. Anyway, that's where you, <laughs> that's where you can trace it, the movement back to. I think that. You know, so, so, so in terms of black people then, in terms of a pivotal moment for black people then, wasn't that just Britain was looking outwards into the world rather than looking into Europe, we're looking to a bigger world? Is that how you would see that that, that, that point, get opportunities for black people to come to Britain? Is that how you would see it? Well, I think that's what I said. No, that, that, that's all <laughs> I just said. That, that's, I, I find this really interesting because I asked that question from the point of view where black people it's a pivotal moment because they were truly free. And for me, okay, just because they've come to the UK, that doesn't mean that they were free. Look at what's happened to the Windrush generation. They did not know that actually they were not free at all and that they would end up in such horrific circumstances where they were, they essentially grew up here, their whole life was here, but then they were being told to go back home when Britain was home. So it's kind of like, I, I realize it's such a complex, multifaceted question that I've asked you guys. Um, but I guess pivotal moment for me in the sense that when were they liberated? You know, because that you, am I wrong in saying or in believing that even though they were here like basically a thousand years ago, they were still not free, you know, they were like they were am I am I wrong in, in believing that? That's kind of how, how it's presented. It depends how you define freedom. <laughs> Thank you. It depends what you mean by freedom. You know, legally, it, uh... legally, there was never any positive statute law in Britain in you know outlining enslaving people, it's outlining slave slave codes. You know, whereas if you compare it with you know Portugal in the 15th century, mm. France, uh, the Code Noir of six, I think it's 1685, and then all the colonies uh, like Virginia in the 1670s. Uh, I think Barbados actually is earlier than that. But Miranda, uh, Miranda, we've had to, we've been you know, like you, set out laws saying black people are enslaved, white people are free. This is what a black person is allowed to do. This is what a white person is allowed to do. And it's very clear and it's written down. And in Britain, that never happens. Now, that doesn't mean that people can't treat each other badly. It just means that the law, um, and that's why when, you, when it comes to court in various court cases in the, uh, in the 18th century that culminate in the Somerset case, of 1772 you know that's why there's something to argue with there um but it's no it's complicated and i i think there are various moments where people might claim that people have become freer you know like the somerset case or uh, uh where it's ruled that um former enslavers can't kidnap the the black people and take them back to the colonies and sell them uh or or even when enslavement has ended in 1834 across the british empire they're still then the people working on those sugar plantations are then forced into an apprenticeship for at least four years after that. So they're not really free at all. Uh, so it's it's complicated. But I, what I would say is that when you compare what was happening in Britain with what was happening in, in a colony like Virginia or, or Jamaica or Barbados, uh, you know, those rules I was talking about, you know, there wasn't the uh, intermarriage wasn't allowed. Uh, testifying in court wasn't allowed. You know, a black man was not allowed to testify against a white man in, in court in in the Caribbean for much of its history. Whereas in British history, there's been intermarriage since at least the 16th century. You know that there is, and uh, and and as I was saying, various examples of Britain British people testifying in court being baptized. There's a, a lot of those sorts of uh, civic freedoms. I think that you can you can trace through the history. Wow, Miranda, the, 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 there's a dichotomy, and you and I have discussed this dichotomy in terms of you, you, there was no slavery in Britain or legally, but we know there were slaves in Britain with documentary. There were slaves in the 1750s, 1756. There's yeah. so people being sold in Liverpool, my own town, that were being sold. And I think there's a, a dichotomy at the heart of the British soul at this time in terms of you talked about the Code Noir in, um, in um, Europe. And, and they, they were legally, you could be a slave in Europe, and there was there were slave codes in the Caribbean. The most heinous one, the most lethal for, for the slave, was the Barbados Slave Code, and that was written by English people. That was written by English people. So you can say, on the one hand, in Britain, no slaves here, we're all free, and it's lovely. Yeah, they treated their slaves appallingly. The, 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 <laughs> 
hands cut off, whipped for doing for, for, for in the most dreadful things. So in the psyche, there's something going on there, and I've, I've never fully resolved it. The only way I, I, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put this to you: it was all about money, profit. That's what they wanted to make that sugar, get that sugar moving, get it out and sell the sugar. So that was the driving force, and it kind of blinded them to the humanities of the, the decency of looking after the, the, the workers. I can find no other reason for, the, for having such a, a, on the one hand in Britain, you're all free and it's all nice. You're part of society, you can vote and you can own property and all that stuff. But in the Caribbean, you know, you are a slave and you're treated as lower in the most despicable, brutal way. I've never, I've never that resolved that. I think that really moves us nicely on to questions. I'm going to open the floor up now. Elaine has actually commented that the air is too pure in Britain, I believe. And so with what Michael has just told us, where um, you have slave laws effectively being written by the Brits, um, but not in Britain, it's kind of like, oh, over here in Britain, everything is fine and everything is, is cool and you can be of our society, but actually elsewhere where we have control, we're going to treat you in the most inhumane way. And I find that so interesting. Okay, we have a big question. And what I'm going to do is, um, I'm actually going to like blow up people's questions so that everyone can see them because it makes it easier. So we're in question mode now, Wu. Um, I'm gonna start off with Michael's question. It's rather long but I like long questions. So what would you recommend reading slash looking at if I wanted to look at the percep perceptions of race in pre-Empire Europe? I often think that religion was a bigger divide, i.e. the Spanish referring to the Elizabethan churches as mosques. I worry that this may be true, but a little simple. Yeah, can I, so yeah, I think one of the main things I argue in my book is that, um, uh, you know, there's that, there's always prejudice in every society, but in in Tudor society, um, people would much more likely to be judged by on their religious status or their class status uh, than on the colour of their skin. Um, so so uh, you know, which is shown by the way that um, Africans are accepted into the Church of England, baptised, married, and buried there. Um, but, but yeah, as you said, as we were saying, kind of in in Europe, that 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 Catholic. Um, Protestant divide, but also a, a kind of Catholic heathen divide, or you know, sort of even yeah, you know, before the before Protestantism, Protestantism emerges. Uh, but uh, but you know, there is an intersectionality there. So um, if you you know, if a, if if somebody if if a European met an African for the first time, they might assume that they were not a Christian. Uh, they might then be happy to to um teach them yeah they might want i mean i mean there's a whole there's a whole issue here about whether um whether christianity is being imposed on people whether that's the kind of uh uh colonial kind of uh, prejudice behavior in the first place or you know almost a racist behavior of assuming that your religion is superior to whatever beliefs they might hold but that's a whole other kettle of fish um but but yeah i mean religion is obviously a central um issue the book I'd recommend, in, 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 which is almost similar to Miranda's book, same period, but it's, it's by Carmen Frashisha. It's about 16th century Spain and, and the art there. And in the art, you can understand how they, you can interpret how they treated their, their black people. Because it's, it's, if I sum it up, in fact, that there were almost 2 million black people in, in Spain in, during in the period. And as Miranda indicated earlier, perhaps up to 10% of some of the cities were black. Yet there's very, very few surviving portraits or pictures which depict black people, which is in contrast to Italy and Germany, where black, where are black people in portraiture? They, they, have, they have a presence, and, and not so in Spain. And there's a particular reason for that in terms of their relationship with the Moors and Islam, and having been conquered and dominated on so long, that, that their attitude to black people is very different from that in the rest of uh, the, the rest of Europe. And then when you layer on the Catholicism, it kind of ma ma makes it even more interesting and complex. So if you want to get an understanding, I, I, there's two books I'd recommend. One of obviously is Miranda's book, Black Tube is a great start, but also the common facetious book on uh, 16th century Spanish uh, Spanish art. In fact, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, we'll do a, a reading list 
at the end of this and we'll, I'll, I'll give you the full yeah, details well, of the book. I'll have a reading list sent out and I'll publish it on the website as well. So um, everyone will be able to kind of get to grips with some really good literature, which I hope um, they find helpful and useful. Um, just, I know that people are typing questions, so I would just give them a moment. I always say, oh, this is a quick question, but it's never quick. What about black females? So in the UK, so in, in terms of British history, we've heard lots about John Blank and just generally men. Um, and I have no problem with men, I promise. But I know that women, you know, there's a saying behind every great man is an even greater woman. So are there any kind of women that we need to look out for? Well, actually, I meant to say when talking about the pivotal moment of the Reformation was the, the story of Catalina of Motril. So at that pivotal moment where um, uh, Henry VIII uh, decides to divorce Catherine of Aragon, thus setting this great train of, of events in motion, um, one of the key points in his divorce case was that uh, where the big question was whether she had consummated her marriage with Prince um Arthur, his older brother, um, before he died. And the woman who was making the bed at the time was none other than a, a woman uh, described as, as a Moorish woman called Catalina of Matril, who was from Granada in southern Spain. Uh, and uh, when, when the divorce case uh, came up, they sent messengers to try and find her because she'd gone back to Granada married a, a crossbowman called Oviedo and had two daughters uh, and they were trying to find her because they wanted her testimony about what exactly those sheets looked like the next morning um, and so there you are there's a fascinating story right there someone's written a great play about it of uh, a, a, um, a woman of colour at the centre of that that big story that we thought we knew uh, but we did mention the ivory bangle lady uh, and woman. Uh, so going right back there, there's a, yes. And um, when I found um, you know two uh, two two hundred um, African people in in Tudor Britain, uh, you know about half of them were women. But it is harder to track down women's stories. And I mean this is this goes back to what we were saying at the beginning about great men. I mean if again if you only look for prominence, then you're not you know, until fairly recently going to come across a lot of stories about, about women because it's just harder to find their stories. But there are there are a few in, in the period that we're talking about. And then, the, you know, it's a very ordinary story. So uh, one of the, there's a woman called Catalina who's living in Armandsbury, which is a village just outside Bristol in the 1620s. Uh, and she's just living a normal life there. She has a cow. She, uh, you know, she sells butter and milk from the cow. She has a little, you know, her only luxury is a pewter candlestick. Also, you know, we just never these tiny details about her because we have a list of all the property that she owned at her death. But that in itself is so significant because she was not property. She was not owned by somebody else. She owned uh, a cow and some clothes worth about two pounds total, which is more than you'd think. Um, so that's the same budget as they used to uh, kit out all of the women they set out for Virginia to make wives to the early colonists. You know, they could buy a whole woman's wardrobe for two pounds. Anyway, that's a, a footnote. But but you know, and then as you come later into the 18th century, you get more details, don't you, about women like Dido Elizabeth Bell, uh, Michael Weebly, Mary yeah. Prince. Do you know what? It's a great question you asked there. In terms of the way I look at it, I look at it. today. We look at history through many different lenses because history was in the past had been written by white men and look and, and it reflected you know great white men the deeds of great you know the Nelsons and Napoleons these, these so called great men but now Both married Caribbean heiresses <laughs> there you go <laughs> but now but now what's exciting now is the black people are looking back in history women are looking at history disabled are looking back in history so history some people say history is being rewritten. Calm down. I think it's, it's just been reinterpreted. It's been looked yeah. at again. We're looking at the people who've been left out. You know, we're finding the places for them. Some, you know, you mentioned women, but as I say, there's other lots of other histories. There's one one history which is like challenging right now: critical race theory on history. 
So yeah. that the, the, their lens is race, emasculating not just blackness, but race and kind of the, the, the way we understand race today. So that's the, 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 that's a very nuanced view of history. In the same way, feminists, the feminist view of history, or there's a black feminist view of history. So there's some new lenses being brought. There's some great papers, some great books coming out, and I probably will include some on, on on the list to give you a flavor for the different ways in the way different ways into history. I think um, that takes us nicely into our next question, which is rather long. Please don't apologize guys for long questions. It's completely fine. But, um, and the question is as a primary school teacher, I'd love advice on how to get more black history through the different year groups while still making sure it's age appropriate. For example, not getting into slavery until perhaps year six, the curriculum as it, as it is now recommends looking at african-american figures rosa parks oh. martin luther king yes um, and some <laughs> others like Man mandela but the only british one is mary seacole and that is all that's mentioned or suggested for black history in the curriculum i'd l also love some primary school friendly black british history although i'm not sure it exists question mark Hopefully this session has told you that it definitely exists. Yeah, she means Black British History books, she's saying in the chat. But, um, yeah, Michael, I've got a lot to say on this. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've, got, I've got an awful lot to say in this. Can I just go, just, just yeah. let me go straight in at the American thing. Now, we, we, this is something that goes to the heart of Black British history. There's a kind of a denial of a Black British history in preference for an American history. You know, the, the Martin Luther King, the Rosa Parks. In some ways, that's an easy story. And easy in the, in the sense you can find about it, and easy in the sense it doesn't affect anybody's mentality here in Britain. But there was a bus strike here in the Bristol bus strike, and that, offend, you know, that, that offended some people because the bus drivers went on strike. They said, enough of this. We're not going to be discriminated against. And they actually won. And there's a plaque to them in the Bristol bus station. Here. But that's not celebrated now. It's, it's well documented in Bristol. But people don't it, it, don't talk about it because it doesn't. It, it kind of it upset. It maybe upset people that that there were black people uh, who who fought for their rights. Let me give you another one, another example. I think is really important in terms of um, slavery. Come back to slavery. Uh, the um, in Manchester, in Manchester, the 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 mill workers went on strike, went on strike to because they want they didn't want to handle slave goods, they didn't want to handle the slave cotton. And th these are stories which aren't told about because they don't fit the narrative. They don't reflect the, the, the story of, of, the, of Britain and its empires and um, um, moving aboard in a great way. So the stories are there uh, to, to be told, a, Br a very British history story, which is parallels American history, parallels without the brutality, not as brutal, but the same things happening in Britain and, the ch and they're there. And so, so in, in terms of... Uh, of working in primary schools. Can I just do my my, what my a little plug for my project here? Forgive me for this, can I? Of course. It, 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 uh, 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 it's John Blank. We've talked about John Blank. He's a pivotal figure because he's the first person of African descent we have an image and a record of. And many people deny that there were black tutors, but they were there, as Miranda's book shows. And there's a fabulous Westminster tournament role, a very dramatic picture, lots of gold, yellow, blue. It's a beautiful thing. And I work when I do uh, workshops in schools for kids to um, to reimagine John Blank. We talk about him, we just give him his history, and then they they write about him. We've had some raps about him. We've had some drawings. If you check out JohnBlank.com workshops, you'll see the kind of thing that we do. We introduce the we introduce um, students, uh, young people, to a black presence in uh, in 16th century Britain, which is a shock to many people. So there are things to be to be done, and again, we'll put that on we'll put that on the the, uh, the reading list in terms of uh, some activity we recommend, and also some websites because there's one great website, the Our Migration Story. But I want to I want to stop there. But I'll, I'll let Miranda come back. We'll put that on the, the reading list, Our Migration Story. Yeah. So I think the really good news is that um, there are primary school teachers out there who are already doing this work and have done this work, and I've been in touch with them recently. Uh, so there will be some um, curriculum outlines and schemes of work that you can probably copy paste uh, because we all know teachers have not enough time on their hands. And uh, so, and I think, you know, again, when you 
I think I think you need to begin at the beginning. And as we've talked about, you know, if you're teaching the Romans, you can talk about black people in Roman Britain. You, if you're teaching the Tudors, you can teach about the black Tudors. Uh, there will always be an angle, you know, when you talk about, if you do teach about the Crusades, you know, just ask those questions of the students, you know, do you, you know, it wasn't just us going there, then, you know, people must have come back too, you know, just, it's about a, a way of seeing history, the questions you ask of the traditional topics and that, that you get, that's how you get black history into the classroom. Uh, another way is to go and do a local study. I know a lot of curriculum calls for a local study. And as long as you can find one parish register mentioning an African in your local, um, in your local archives or any kind of local history, maybe, you know, and there's plenty of it around the country. And uh, so, so, so that's another way of bringing it into the classroom. Uh, so yeah, so there is support. There are other teachers doing this. And um, if you send me your details, somehow then I, I can hook you up for the others. I think someone's actually writing an article for the Historical Association magazine uh, primary history on this uh, for the next issue. So there is hope. And I think this is our last question for the evening from Yutunde on YouTube. She said, um, Surely the slavers' behaviour towards the complicit African traders would have been different. What are your thoughts? Okay, I'll have a go. Let me tell you, I looked, I've done, done some, I've read a little bit about this, and and the reason I have a heavy heart, it's about money. It's about money in terms of they they had something. Two, two, two people were trading here. The the Africans had the slaves that the the that the uh, slave the slave was wanted. And they negotiated. The challenge was the challenge was that that it wasn't the, that the slavers pushed them too far. They wanted more more slaves than they could provide. And then there were problems, there were challenges, there were issues. But nevertheless, in terms of the trade, it was a trade at the start. Certainly, was a trade between equals. One had something the other had, and they could trade, and they they worked together. They worked together in this. So I, 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 when you use the word complicit, in, 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 it, it seems that the slavers had one over. No, the slave traders had something, had, had wanted the slaves, so they had to work with the um, with, with, with the African traders. Yeah, I, th I think it's um, always, it's never a good idea to tr expect black people to be a sort of monolithic, monoculture mono where all of them are the same and are treated the same i think and um what i'm trying to say is that throughout uh, black history black british history throughout history you know different people are treated differently depending on the context in which they meet each other you know when francis drake met the panama maroons they were black but he saw them as brilliant potential military allies against the spanish and they captured spanish treasure together when uh, those early Tudor traders go to Morocco and what they call Guinea, uh, they're actually on the back foot. The um, the West Africans have the power in that situation because it's just one small boat and, and, and they, they, have, they have the advantage there. Um, when the Moroccan ambassador turns up to the court of Elizabeth I, he's treated with the, you know, the usual pomp and ceremony. Um, so obviously, whenever people encounter each other, they treat each other differently, depending on a whole wealth of factors. Uh, you know, and, and as Michael says, you know, money money is unfortunately key in that. But um, I will tell you that in 1620, uh, when uh, some uh, some Eng English merchants went down the Gambia River, they were offered some uh, African women to buy, and uh, they rejected them. And they said, we do not buy or sell any that have our own shapes. So the story isn't always exactly as you think it would be. Unfortunately, that, that did not, uh, they did not uh, stick to that over the next century or two. Uh, but, you know, there, there are lots of different stories there that complicate, complicate and nuance the narrative. And that brings us to 929. And I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who tuned in this evening. A very, very special thank you to Michael and Miranda. Um, I have learned something. Um, I'm sure that everyone who's tuned in today has learned something. Thank you to everyone on YouTube as well. Um, couple of notes, just like 
announcements. If you've signed up for this course and you're in this classroom, please actually email me your address so I can send you a free copy of Miranda's book, which I'm sure you're going to love. Um, I am also doing a draw so people can win a book where Michael's contributed extensively and it's a much bigger book that covers black history across a long period of time. Um, so yes, Britain's black past, some people will be able to win that fantastic book as well. Um, the next session is next week and it's all about um, who paved the way to freedom? And I guess then we'll be able to talk about what we really mean by freedom. Michael kind of already challenged me on that. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I'm keeping the speaker for now a mystery so that you guys keep engaged. So um, yeah, really looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Michael and Miranda. Last thing is to make this possible, I've been fundraising. I've literally put it all together by myself with no help. And I'm so grateful to everyone who's already donated. If you could donate, that would be great. If you can't, just ask your friends and family to do it. I'm almost at the target so I can run the whole course. And yeah, have a wonderful evening. Bye. Also, Bye. this ends really abruptly. So yeah, it's just going to cut out now. But thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs>